My name is Mark Hamilton, and I'm very glad to be here with you at the ASLI Conference 2021 for this panel on river emergencies. My presentation is titled The Art of Echo Poetry, Creating a Strong Dynamic in Response to Environmental Crisis. My assumptions are that the anthropocentric is no longer viable as a cultural imperative. In fact, it is tantamount to echo suicide. And there is a great urgency to alter this perspective as evidenced by global warming. Echo poetry strives to change the paradigm. It is a functional literature with purposeful intent to reconnect body to mind and person to environment. Poetry has always been well suited for the creation of the new. Linguistically flexible patterns can communicate emotions, thoughts, observations, and responding sensibilities to the intricate outer world. These structures of language are technically termed prosodies. They can be the sound clusters of letters or entire mimetic stanzas, each variance representing a relationship between form and content, either small or large, between the outer shell of language and the inner substance of meaning. Prosodies in echo poetry therefore vary and resonate as determined by what best reveals these appropriate relational connections. The process of prosody making creates an intersection, a place to inhabit, and a consequent perspective. As each specific acquires value on the page, all specifics begin to resonate with added levels of meaning. When this happens, singular and separate prosodies accumulate into metaphor, displaying a reciprocity between the body and mind, between the tangible and intangible, or between the individual and their environment. Echo poetry creates a feedback loop by articulating these combinations. It positions us in a relationship with the earth and strengthens through awareness our ability to clarify, respond, make decisions, and direct our actions. Echo poetry allows us access to knowledge beyond the self. We gain a better understanding by expressing the valuation placed upon relationships with the earth. We can test the waters. This dynamic is the true power and potential of echo poetry as it internalizes the shifting of the paradigm away from the anthropocentric toward an improved environmental perspective. As a poet, my purpose was to witness the contemporary environment of the polluted Ohio River Valley. The journals of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, 1803-1806, would serve as a baseline for the pre-industrial natural world. I knew this would not be a trek into John Muir's Wilderness Cathedral, nor a contemplative walk along the quietude of Walden Pond. But I felt it would be an important effort in knowing how our degraded environment might now be defining us and determining who we might become. I am the first person in a hundred or more years to have actually traveled the entire Lewis and Clark expedition route under my own power, traveling on their approximate timetable by paddle and pack animal. I journeyed as a solo voyageur to commemorate our heritage, but also to celebrate our multiculturalism and to especially honor the Native American.
I departed Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in a 15-foot rowing dory under the cold rains of May. From the very start, the river itself was in distress. Human activity was everywhere. At times, nature disappeared. At times, it briefly emerged like a sigh amid all the turmoil. These three poems capture a bit of that essence. The first is entitled, Now. Time follows like a hound, like a scent in the wind and the bushes rushing past. One is forgotten with the next. Existence becomes the feeling of what surrounds. I become tiny, the only self-powered craft on the river moving near shore, safely in the shallows, my elbows at the surface. I'm a part of the river, rather than a power over it. Where I am is all there was. Branches swish past in arcs of oars, drawn out from slate green waters, willows framing red flowers on the mud glaze, their flared petals bursting from tangles of shaggy bark where Neville Island ends in mud shoals with the sharp pinpoint of a buoy's bright light. Commercial piers stagger out with names like Standard LaForge and Buckeye Pipeline Company. Anxieties keep me poised upon the immense gray empty. I sweep through a landscape faster and faster, scanning the emptiness for a meaning and then for an escape, wondering if I could stop or even perceive of myself as stopped, etched into black gone white amid all this clutter. But my questions disappear at bridges, under the exact grids built with individual rivets that divide my crossing in all directions. Everything ends and then begins. Water folds and contorts, pulls down and boils up, blossoming sideways, until the oars are useless, the laws of buoyancy suspect, and any sense of place destroyed. Hidden Voices The river clears out debris, sifting and digesting, washing pollutants away. Recovered in part, the beautiful river ushers me along, never losing its dignity, never complaining nor faltering in its design. It asks nothing of me, demands no reward, requires no sacrifice. Slowly, my adoration grows, the dory bounding over a steeplechase below, on sounds roiling up from proud waters. Fish are almost edible, clam and mussel shell fleck the bank in flickers flying past. At Boggs Run, in fast water, red towboats shuttle empty barges, bank to bank like ants with big black seeds. Shouldered toward the terminal, I row harder into shoal waters, hugging the opposite bank like a mouse navigating along the baseboard of a dance floor. Beneath sweeping arcs of coal-powered wires, the red-jacketed waiters nod condescendingly, and a general raises an eyebrow, rattling his saber above the waltzing shuffle of big black shoes. I cross the busy ballroom of a blue-collar river, the symphony's pit filling with drum and cymbal, crashing against the long piers of consolidated coal then drift away, staying well past, 
down to the radical oxbow at the Indian mounds and the tall single smokestack of Edison Electric coloring in the sky with its big gray crayon. There were many surprises and many point sources of pollution, the cities being major contributors. This sequence of poems expresses my growing awareness of the river as it struggled through Cincinnati and beyond. The first poem is entitled Out City. The distant cluster of factories hidden in the haze the white-walled asphalt plants camouflaged in vapor. I'm surrounded by rainbows of oil, swirling at the confluence of the great Miami River, yawning with its brown and dirty yellow tongue, exhaling fumes from a city's sewage overflow, on storm waters, spruing purulent songs even insects cannot hum. A cavern of webbed branches, arcs and bends, limp and drooping roots in the soggy murk, sprung and rung above a lengthening stretch of mud stench. Unnamed things scatter across the surface, away from a floating bloated carcass of a cow that rocks, swaying with blotches and humps in the refuse. And except for a mosquito revving its wings past my ear, I hesitate to even touch the oars to it. As I continued downriver, I came to a tributary named Whistle Creek. Melted by the weight of coal, barges sink low in the water. Others leave a raft of debris as they pivot from shore. I pull through flows of clinging wood into a wreckage of sunset, onto reflected open petals blossoming from a creek. Carp nibble the green line of algae along the boat. And there is no rush, no extra chores to dry things out. All becomes peaceful and quiet. Here, where everything is worth having. Today, my hands became her hands. Except for the occasional tributary, the Ohio River was decimated by pollution. The biological devastation revealed a nature nearly devoid of life. And it was overwhelming. The world was separating back into its elements, making my mortality fragile, tentative, and stressful. Sometimes there was only the death of clowns. There is no humor in a buck's head, bobbing expressionless in the backwater the torn throat of a towboat throttle growling, nudging the bank. Nor in the afternoon heat, where a macabre cartoon of cowled monks waits in the bleachers, fluffing in the branches, the vultures crowded into the tree, or hunched over a floating fuel sign that points to a hidden gas dock somewhere up the creek. There is no mirth or mercy in the glaze of afternoons, the reflections bending at their waists and cummerbunds, bald heads and red fleshy hoods flopping to one side as they spread their bony pirate wings. For those are true weapons to tear the soft bellies of the dead. I row away to avoid the smell, but there is death to the left 
and death to the right, and more straight ahead on the flat, wide river. Dozens and dozens of evenly spaced fish floating belly up in little whirlwinds of stench. For half a mile, the air is filled with decay. So at first, I think net fishermen must have created this banquet. But then I realize it is the fish kill from the city's overflowing sewage, diluting slowly downstream from the great Miami River. From the shade, they glide on wings from high limbs to prod and tug at the flesh, bracing their entire bodies into huge backward lunges of feathery tuggings, while others, tired by the competitive eating, are resting on perches as happily as spectators in the bleachers of a traveling circus. The spinning, leaping harlequins in baggy pants heaped into piles like dead clowns. Thank you for being here at this year's ASLI conference. If you get a chance, please read Dr. Vest's book, Will of the Land. It is a wonderful place to start and a great place to rediscover the meanings of what we do. Also, thank you to OVEC for their continuing efforts to restore the beauty to the Ohio River Valley. My website is posted here with a personal invitation to access the echo video clips from my return journey from the Pacific Ocean on the going to the Buffalo Trail over the Rocky Mountains. With the help of Nez Perce guides, the expedition tried again on June 26th. This time, they were successful. 